All right, I think we can get started whenever you're, you're ready, Dr. Ness. Sounds good. Um, well, thank you um, for the time today. Um, I wanted to just introduce myself and say that um, I um, am probably one of the people at this meeting that is outside of the field of medicine. Um, as my fifth grader likes to tell me, I am a, a doctor, but I'm not the kind of doctor who helps people, um, meaning I have a PhD, not a medical degree. Um, and I'm actually so excited about Reach Out and Read because I think it's one of the organizations that does such an amazing job of reaching across um, what is so often siloed um, and reaching into social science, which is what I am. I am a university professor at Fordham University, um, a reading researcher, a teacher, educator. Um, and for the last, and I'm somebody who has always been interested in issues of access and equity. And so two years ago, I created this podcast called End Book Deserts, um, which is meant to bring awareness to the, uh, the, the issues of access to books. And so I'll just start by um, going over how we'll spend our time today, and then I'll jump into um, the content. Um, we are going to start by defining what I mean by a book desert. It may be um, a term that many of you have heard, but we will actually explore some of the data around book access. And then we'll spend some of our time looking at book distribution programs and what the research says about what makes a program effective and we will explore the implications of those. Um, and so I will start with a little bit of a backstory. Um, as I said, I am a literacy educator, teacher educator, reading research, um, and my professional organization is the International Literacy Association. I was just um, nominated to the board of directors. It is an organization of 300,000 um, literacy educators, teachers, school librarians, school leaders um, across the globe. And several years ago, we worked on a position statement called the Children's Right to Read. And it is a pretty basic statement. I, I believe I have all um, 10 rights to read. Um, and I was sort of ruminating over this document and thinking about the second one. Children have the right to access texts in print and digital formats. And as much as I believe in that, um, too often that is not the case. And when you look at these statistics around access, um, they tell a pretty pretty grim story. Um, I wanted to introduce you, if you're not aware already, um, to an organization called Unite for Literacy, which has created this book desert map. And I'm going to give you some time to explore it later on because it is an interactive map that literally lets you zoom in on your particular area to understand um, how much access there is um, to books around um, particular areas. It's a pretty cool resource. Um, it is not, you sort of have to search a little bit on the Unite for Literacy uh, website, but um, very useful to look at what the, the realities are around. And I'll tell you in a second about how this map, um, the data around the map were, um, were compiled. Um, but first, when I define um, a book desert, I'm really looking at the definition that comes from the International Literacy Association, which defines the um, idea of a book desert as under-resourced or underserved areas and homes with little access to written materials. The term came out in 2010. It was actually sort of right around the time that Mich Michelle Obama was doing her work around healthy kids and food access and sort of talking about food deserts. Um, and it really didn't become a term that was prominent in the literature. Again, I'm talking about social science literature um, until Susan Newman wrote about it in 2016. Um, and we'll explore some of the research around, um, written by Susan Newman. She is really the uh, most prominent reading researcher working around around book access, and she served as the Assistant Secretary of Education um, under the, the first Bush administration. She's currently a professor at um, NYU. 
when I look at the idea of a book desert, we so often go to under-resourced or underserved. Um, I, also, I also really, when I think about book deserts, think about particular populations of children that are overlooked. And by that, I mean kids in the foster care system, children whose families are deployed, um, children who um, have are incarcerated or their family members may be incarcerated, um, children from the LGBTQ community. So there are, as much as we can focus on access and equity as a socioeconomic component, I also have sort of widened what I consider to um, be a population that lacks access to books um, a little bit more broadly in the podcast. So um, when we look at the figures around book access, pretty bleak, and I should say that these numbers are pre-COVID, that 32 million American children are going without books in their homes, their schools, and their communities. And this comes from um, an article written by Randy Weingarten, who is the um, teachers union, the, the president of the AFT, the largest um, organization um, of teachers union. And when I bring up the fact that this is a pre-COVID figure, we have to assume that um, these numbers are going up as so many kids, their points of access to books was public libraries or school libraries. And as those have shuttered and closed, um, certainly book access becomes even more of an issue. So when we think back to that map that I showed you um, from Unite for Literacy, how did they compile it? Well, what they did was they looked at student test scores on the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Pro uh, Progress. And I should say, um, I forgot to mention this earlier, um, normally when I speak, I speak to other teachers, I speak to literacy educators, and I sort of know their background um, knowledge. So if I um, am explaining things really explicitly, it's I'm, I'm just trying, I, I don't know everybody's level of um, background knowledge in the world of education, so I'm trying to be really explicit with that. Um, so the National Assessment for Educational Progress taken in the fourth grade, the eighth grade, and the twelfth grade, when we see the, the figures that give us sort of the, the um, barometer on where our children are performing, they're usually from the NAEP. And until 2012, I believe it was, it might, uh, it might be 2016, I think, actually, now that I think of it, um, in addition to um, standardized test scores, the NAEP used to ask kids about the frequency with which they read as well as how many books were at their home. So the what Unite for Literacy did is took the data around that and then put it into that geographic map that, again, you can zoom right into particular neighborhoods and communities. And what we found is that kids in the red area, the lower quadrants, um, are kids who don't have a habit of reading and have very few books at home. And you can start to see this big discrepancy. In the field of reading, we call this the Matthew effect, which refers to, it was written first um, by a researcher named Keith Stanovich in 1986. It is a reference to the biblical story where the rich get rich and the poor get poor, and that we never really close the gap between these quadrants of kids. So you can start to see that the lines for the kids who have a habit of reading and have books at their home, they start to really outperform um, their colleagues in terms of vocabulary and comprehension and academic achievement. And those gaps are never really addressed. So again, I bring this up because it sort of gives you a backstory on how Unite literacy um, created that book desert map. Um, the findings of um, Unite for Literacy have been really examined in a, a pretty wide body of research. Um, I was joined in my breakout group yesterday by from somebody from Scholastic. Scholastic is, does an amazing biannual report that's usually about 3,000 children, families, and caregivers. And we start to see a pretty di big discrepancy between um, our, between socioeconomic and between um, different ethnic groups or racial backgrounds, um, according to Scholastic and that biannual report. 
And of course, when we look at the idea of book access, we have to tip our hat to Nell Duke, who again is the, I'm sorry, to Susan Newman, who is the researcher that really did work around this. And her article in 2016 is a pretty amazing one. I, um, I'm happy to email you a PDF of it because what she did is she um, went into three different cities, DC, Detroit, and Los Angeles. And she looked at two different neighborhoods in each city and spent some time literally pounding the pavement and walking through these neighborhoods during summer vacation. And she was specific to do it during summer vacation because she wanted to see if schools were closed, how easily or how difficult would it be for young children to find books in their neighborhood. And you can start to see that the difference in um, book access between a low income area, Anacostia, which is on the southeast side, I believe, actually the northeast side of um, DC and Capitol Hill, huge, huge disparities. And what I should say also is that of the books that were found, these are, um, these were the, the vast majority of them were not text print rich. So many times they were coloring books, which certainly are not, you know, a snuggle up and have a, a breathing interaction with the parent. Um, and we start to see that these figures really um, are, are pretty pervasive across the literature. We start to see them in all different ways being replicated um, according to poverty, not just our high socioeconomic status groups, but also our borderline communities. And that borderline figure has certainly grown over the last decade. Um, that kids without, that are living in low income areas and borderline really have um, a much more difficult find time finding access to books. And this figure it, to me is just so compelling. During summer vacation, that 830 kids would have to share one book in order to continue summer reading, continue independent reading. Um, so pretty staggering results that um, still keep me up at night and have fueled my work um, around book deserts and around book access. And there's so many different ways to present the data, but obviously um, the findings are pretty much all the same that um, in the last two decades, even in the last decade, there is significant differences with regard um, to access to books. And um, then we start to unpack, well, what does that mean for our children? What does it mean for academic readiness for language and literacy skills and again i'm a reading researcher that's where i spend my um, my time is really understanding how this impacts us when kids come to kindergarten how does it impact a fourth grade classroom teacher or an eighth grade classroom teacher and we start to see that when books are scarce that that parent child or caregiver child reading interaction which we hopefully are seeing at least once a day really becomes an event, an occasion, and not something that is just so entrenched in the home environment. It's not a routine um, as written about by Susan Newman. And again, this is from the article in Urban Education 2016. And if you're interested in it, I'm happy to, um, to share the PDFs of any of these articles that I'm talking about today. So let's unpack a little bit more closely. What does access mean? Why is it so important for kids to have access access to books. Well, we know that one of the um, best predictors of children's later literacy growth is their literacy preparation coming into kindergarten, um, that kids who are read to at home have stronger vocabularies, they have stronger oral language skills, which then improves their comprehension. They have stronger ability um, in terms of attention and focus. We're now starting to see how read alouds impact children's executive function, um, that kids who are read to at home have better attitudes and more interest in reading and um, better caregiving um, relationships between parent and child. 
And so often when I speak about book deserts, people always say, well, what about the public library? Isn't the public library enough? And we know so much um, that the public library, as, um, as rich and as meaningful of the places it can be, it certainly is not the only place, the only go-to point um, for books. But we do see that when kids also have access to the libraries, and by that I mean home libraries, we start to see a big um, difference in NAEP scores at fourth grade and eighth grade. So we really start to understand what it means for very young children, ages two, ages three, ages four, um, and their longitudinal academic development. Um, and one of my favorite articles to understand this a little bit more is the 2010 article that looks specifically, oops, sorry about that, um, that looks at the impact of um, a scholarly culture in the home meaning how much of a home library there is. And this was actually an international study. And they found that um, a child growing up in a home library with 500 books, that has more of an impact on their educational achievement um, that, um, than their parents' caregiving. So let me give you a, uh, their caregiver's educational um, level. Let me give you a second to read this quote out because I just love it so much. And so when I highlight um, some of the programs, of course, in addition to reach out and read about um, the importance of growing a home library, this is why it matters so much. This is why the work that we do um, is so important. And I will say that as long as Reach Out and Read has been around, um, fortunately, book distribution and um, literacy activists, they have a long um, history in our um, American culture. Um, I've got some pictures of just different ways that people have um, become their own independent book distribution warriors themselves. You can see that these, um, some of them are from the um, Roosevelt era. And um, if you are a fiction fan, there's a fabulous Jojo My, um, uh, Moyes book I'm blanking on the name about a woman, I will put it in the chat at some point, about a woman who um, is a literacy warrior, literally goes through Appalachia on horseback to distribute books. And you can see that with the advent of cars, we started to do it in different ways. And this work has carried us throughout wartime. Um, publishing houses during World Wars I and II specifically created pocket size um, versions of classic books so that um, soldiers overseas could put them in the pockets of their pants. So as they were waiting in the trenches, they had something to do. And I just love this image of this woman literally walking um, with a backpack um, of books. And what we are seeing today is now the version of um, book access through the pediatric approach with Reach Out and Read. And I should explain that my connection to Reach Out and Read, as I have um, done this podcast for the last two years, I had the pleasure of having Brian Gallagher on. Um, I was a longtime fan of Reach Out and Read, longtime fan girl of Perry Class, always reading her work. Um, and I really, what I have applauded so much in Reach Out and Read is their work to reach across, to make something which um, literacy, we so often think of it as an educational issue. And here we are really working in an interdisciplinary focus um, with the primary care um, practices. So um, during COVID, we started to see how much more important this was. Um, many of you are aware of First Book, which is another major organization. Um, so we'll explore some of the big distribution um, programs in a minute and see what the research says about their effectiveness. But before we do that, I want to give you 
a minute um, actually to look at this statistic that yesterday when I was in a breakout group, um, we had a conversation about diverse and inclusive texts and there were some great statistics around this. Um, but if you haven't seen this one from the Cooperative Children's Book Center at University of Wisconsin, it tells a pretty convincing story about as much as we want representative texts, we are still not there yet. There are more books produced now with talking animals than there are reflecting our Asian American students, our um, Native American students, pretty compelling. And when this came out, it was really a rally cry to teachers and school librarians and primary care um, practice providers to the publishing house to push us forward in meaningful ways. Um, so I'm interested to see when the next version of this comes out, if we'll start to see talking animals going down and um, our BIPOC um, books being more prevalent in bookshelves and in our publishing world. So I wanna give a second um, to let you get into breakout groups. I'm just gonna um, do them randomly. I wanna give you the chance to, on your own, Google the Unite for Literacy Book Desert Map. You have to put in Book Desert Map. If you just do Unite for Literacy, you'll come to an amazing wealth of digital books, which are all free and many of them have been translated, um, but you won't directly go to that Book Desert Map. Um, I think it's really interesting if um, everyone can go in and zoom in on their particular area and just play around with it for a little bit. Um, and then in your breakout groups, feel free to reflect on some of the research that I have um, shared with you, as well as that map. Um, that, uh, as well as that, I'm sorry, that graphic that was about, um, that was about the statistics around um, diverse books. So I'm going to just randomly put you in four groups or so, and we'll spend about four minutes before we come back together to start to unpack what it means to be an effective book distribution program. So I will pop these in the chat as well um, and give you a heads up when we get there. All right, so um, as you come back, I was just, um, thank you to whoever popped in the title of the book I was searching for. It is um, Jojo Moy is the, give us, the Giver of Stars um, about a character who goes throughout Kentucky as a part of Eleanor Roosevelt's traveling libraries. Um, a question that came up in the chat is about the impact, um, are there research studies about the impact of reading aloud to children, to babies in utero? I don't know of any in utero. I do know that um, there is work out of the University of Virginia that looked at the impact of reading to medically fragile babies in the NICU um, and amazing things what they found. Um, they created a reading garden and they sort of created three different levels of read aloud intensity for the um, how medically fragile the baby was. So if there was a very, very premature baby that was very medically fragile, the mother would whisper read versus a baby who was about to get sent home um, and they did it for duration and um, volume of reading. And what they found is that for babies in the NICU um, being read aloud, their heartbeat calmed and their um, oxygen levels increased. And mothers themselves often reported less postpartum depression um, because so often when mothers are in the NICU, they're having an experience, they don't, you know, they can't pick up their baby and they're not sure how to communicate with them in a way um, that is a nurturing way and so reading aloud gave them um, a way to do that so that's um, research out of the University of Virginia so pretty interesting stuff um, so I hope you got to explore a little bit more around um, book deserts it's pretty interesting stuff um, and I will say the research is continuing to come out on it um, so I wanted to focus on one specific city Philadelphia and the reason I'm choosing this specific city is because there is an amazing organization it's actually a coalition called um, um, read by fourth grade and it brings together a um, number of literacy programs and um, book distribution programs like reach out and read and this was the feature article of a two thousand the featured city of an article that literally is hot off the presses 2021 and it came out in the American Educational Research um, Journal AERJ which is the cream of the crop in social science like any professor going up for tenure if you've got that on your CV like 
you're, you're, you're doing pretty well. And this was written by Susan Newman and colleagues. And what they looked at is they went to Philadelphia, which has made this concerted effort to try to get kids literacy skills on grade level by fourth grade. And we know that Philly is a city who is very culturally rich, but also has some real challenges in terms of unemployment, in terms of poverty, and in terms of adult literacy skills. And so um, again, I'm happy to send the article itself, but I'll just unpack some of this because it is brand new. Again, read by fourth grade is this huge citywide effort and there's um, over 90 organizations that all are coming together with the same goal which is increasing student literacy and kids growing their own personal home libraries and so what they did is they looked they used geospatial um, data collection to look at where books were going they looked at focus groups around the effectiveness of each of the programs. They looked at um, the parent and caregiver experience. So I bring this up because I want us to think around what these findings mean to um, mean to reach out and read. So they, this was a one year data collection and they found that um, over about half a million, a million and a half dollars of um, books went out, about 450,000 books. But what they found is that the books were not always going to the places that they should be. In other words, if you went into that Unite for Literacy book desert map and really went to the areas of concentrated poverty, that not enough books were going into the areas of concentrated poverty, books instead were going to the borderline communities and actually more books were going to working class families and middle income families than were going to those areas of concentrated poverty. So there's this mismatch between the poverty and um, the program efforts to get the books to um, sort of the, the target population. And so the authors use this finding to conclude that the quantity of books often supersedes the decisions about the quality of the books and the content of the books. And let me unpack that a little bit more as well. So what they found is um, across these programs, most parents and parent groups who were interviewed and participated in focus groups um, said that they were not consulted in the selection of books. They were given books, they had no input, they had no ability to choose, and that organizations for the most part didn't match the book with the particular kind of child or demographic of their area. So for example, if there was an area where there was a large Vietnamese population, that particular book distribution program didn't necessarily flood all of their Vietnamese translated books into that area. So there wasn't sort of a match between the fabric of the community and the books that were given. And that children had a limited choice in what they could choose from. And there was more fiction than nonfiction, more narrative stories than nonfiction, informational, procedural books. Many parents were saying things like, I want more books that show my kid how to be a citizen, how to ride the bus, how to get to school. You know, I don't want a long story. I want sort of short bursts of nonfiction and informational text. Um, parents often felt bombarded by books. Some parents said, there's so many books, like we can't even keep track of them. And that that saturation often led to resentment. It was, although these programs were well intended, so many times recipients said, I'm sort of getting this as a judgment on my parenting. Meaning the more books you give me, the worse of a parent you think that I am. And there were not specific um, intentions to match, as I said earlier, the population or the culture of a book um, to uh, a, a, a population to, to the books. And there were certainly um, requests for bilingual books. Um, and we see that um, time and time again. That there were more requests for simplistic concept books 
that had colorful words, colorful pictures, and that helped parents either who described themselves as a non-native English speaker or um, didn't identify themselves as literate, they felt more confident and more able to you to read or to engage in conversation and language activities with a book that was shorter and more concept-based. And there was also a lot more requests for what is age appropriate in terms of what to expect of my two-year-old with regard to literacy behaviors. What should I expect from my four-year-old with regard to literacy behaviors? So parents wanted more of the, what should I be doing with my kid? What should I be, um, how should I be reading? How should I be um, speaking with my book? What should I be expecting? And um, that again, as well intentioned as these programs were, um, it was so often about the numbers of books being given out as opposed to was this the right book for the right child at the right time, a way um, provided for the parent and caregiver to have a meaningful interaction around the book. So again, this is 2021 research, so it is brand new and uh, got a significant amount of funding. It's pretty rare that we can really study something that's um, 90 programs coming together in a citywide effort. Um, and again, it's from AERJ, American Educational Research Journal. Um, and I'm happy to email it to you as a PDF if you are interested in reading more, because I'm just giving you the bullet points. There's a lot to unpack here, not only in the geospatial um, looks where they sort of to figure out which books are going to which areas. And remember that that big finding was that there is that more books were going to kids in working class and middle class families than kids in areas of concentrated poverty. Um, and then we start to see these this feedback from parents saying it's too much. I can't even keep track of the books and I'm starting to resent it. Um, so some important implications, I think. And if we have time, I'm going to um, ask you to check in with some colleagues about what this particular study um, means for you and for Reach Out and Read in your community. Um, and a big quote that I loved, although some parents look forward to receiving books, others seem to feel pressured into taking them, an unwanted gift to be stowed away with all the others. There's a tone of resistance in comments and a desire to control their world rather than have it controlled for them. Um, so again, that often came from um, parents saying, I couldn't choose which book, my child couldn't choose which book. Um, we're getting these long narrative story books and picture books as opposed to the concept books that I feel comfortable with. Um, so important stuff to unpack there. So um, I'll spend some time thinking about some successful book donation programs that, um, and I'm focusing just on three specifically because there is a body of research around them. Um, and some of the themes that we will see in this data is that these programs that are successful are meeting families where they are. And obviously that is so important um, in terms of reach out and read in the sense that you are literally meeting families um, in the in the doctor's office, um, that there is some sort of pedagogical instruction, meaning there is some conversation with the program to the parent or caregiver and how to use these books. It's not just a, you know, drop off and go kind of thing. And um, that successful book programs really value feedback and text choices from children and families. And again, I'm gonna focus on three specific ones because there is data around them. And so I'll give a little bit of um, overview of each of these programs. And again, happy to send any of the PDFs um, of the research that I'm showing. So many of us know Imagination Library. I was um, able to have them on my podcast. Um, actually, I, um, I'll start first with, um, sorry, Wash and, Re Wash and Learn. Um, Wash and Learn is one of the um, programs that I think is so simple and so brilliant. Um, featured in an article by, um, in The Reading Teacher. And what they did was they created, they went into laundromats in urban areas 
and they took very limited budgets, you know, a couple hundred dollars and bought tables and open face bookshelves and writing materials. And they had a control group and a non-control group. So there were um, six laundromats all in the same area, pretty well matched in terms of who frequents them. We know from understanding laundromats that parents and caregivers tend to go to the same laundromat time and time again. They tend to spend up to two hours there. And I don't know if you've had the experience of been with the little kid in a laundromat and those parents give their kid a, a phone or what have you well they said here's an opportunity we've got this captive audience let's make it a literacy rich environment and so a field of re a team of researchers went and explored what was happening in the treatment site and then what was happening in the typical status quo laundromat and they found that when there was no um literacy center set up kids average on average in that two hour visit or so had about six and a half minutes of interaction with literacy um, versus when we send in a library or we create these literacy rich spaces with you know pretty low cost we're not talking like totally transforming the space we're talking about kid sized couches and books and such that um, kids were engaged in literacy activities 40 on average 47 minutes and we're reading about four books a session and that there are 30 times more literacy activities in experimental groups and to me this is one of those brilliant Laundromats exist all over the country in urban areas and rural areas. This is a pretty low cost way. Um, and there are things like um, Too Small to Read from the Clinton Foundation working with the Laundry Literacy Coalition um, to create laundromats in urban spaces and rural spaces that really are um, entrenched with literacy. So one um, example of a program, really the takeaway here is that when we meet families where they are, that's when we can um, we start to see these things. And I love this quote from Susan Newman that talks about we need to create these spaces that connect homes and schools. We so often, at least in the field of education, talk about the homeschool divide. Um, and where are those opportunities that we can bridge the homeschool divide? And clearly um, a laundromat is one of them. So um, successful program number one um, successful program number two that I'm not going to dive into, the data is still around it, but it's called Barbershop Books. And it is out of New York City by a man named Alan Irby. I'm sorry that it's um, fast forwarding. Um, and it is the idea that when kids are at the barbershop, they're not spending two hours like they are at the laundromat, but families typically go to the barbershop, same one. They sometimes go once a week or once every two weeks. And um, there is a culture, especially in the black community, around barbershops and around salons. Well, let's take our barbershops and let's take our salons and talk to train or create literacy spaces and give instruction into the people who are cutting hair to say, hey, tell me about what you're reading as they're doing it. And we start to see really rich stuff coming up. Barbershop Books is now expanding to Baltimore, my hometown. Um, so I'm excited to see that. And there's a great um, YouTube video from Alan Irby, it's I-R-B-Y, um, who talks about Barbershop Books and he's also joined um i had him on my podcast another great idea of meeting kids and families where they are to um, embrace literacy opportunities and then of course imagination library um i like to make the really bad joke that dahlia parton is doing is working much more than nine to five to get books into the hands of kids what started in one county in tennessee is literally now all over the world and the beauty of imagination library is that they mail books to kids so when you were born in county hospitals that are affiliated with imagination library or put on a list um, every month for the child's first five years, they get a book mailed to them at home. Um, when I sp I've spoken to them twice for my podcast, the second time I spoke to them during the start of the pandemic. And one of my questions that I've always been asking people is how they've adopted and how they've had to transfer their work that was happening face to face to a digital environment. And for Imagination Library, it was seamless because they weren't 
going into schools. They weren't going into food banks. They were mailing things. And so it was um, an approach that was easy um, to do. And again, it's really now all over the world. And Dolly Parton always talks about how she hopes that um, she is remembered for her books and not her looks. And there's a great documentary if you haven't seen it already. I think it's about 45 minutes or so on Imagination Library. Um, and we start to see some research around Imagination Library. Um, again, this is where I'm going to use my literacy research background um, and explain some things. I um, don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence. I just don't know if effect sizes and such are something that you guys talk about in medicine. And so um, what we start to see is that kids who interact around books and um, with Imagination Library, they come to their, their kindergarten readiness is much stronger as measured on, a, on a, an assessment called PALS, which stands for phonologic awareness literacy screening. It's out of the University of Virginia and it is pretty widely adopted as one of the best screeners. It's getting a lot of press lately because they are now introducing it in many states as an early screener for kids, um, kids with dyslexia. We start to see that kids who have interaction with the Imagination Library, their PAL scores are higher and the longer that they're involved and in receiving books at home with Imagination Library, the higher those scores are. So again, we start to see some data really showing that when we meet kids where they are, which is in this case, books being mailed literally to their home, that we start to see kindergarten readiness scores improving. And I know that there is some research now looking at those kids longitudinally. Um, but interestingly, the same um, group of researchers found that when we only give books and we don't involve that conversation with parents and caregivers, that there is not necessarily an increase in the child attending to eyes on text, um, emergent literacy skills, that we have to talk to parents about how to use these books. In other words, it's only when we have conversations with parents about pointing out the words, counting the words, all those sort of literacy behaviors that um, children don't naturally do them on their own more if they're just getting the books alone and not having a program that has that second component, which is the parent and caregiver interaction. Um, and look at this effect size. Here's where, again, I don't know everyone's background knowledge. So effect size, I'm by no means a statistician. I had to take four semesters of stats as a doctoral student. And I still, to this day, 15 years later, believe that I passed it because my um, professor had a granddaughter named Molly um, and just liked me because we shared a common name. Um, but effect size in education really is a measure of how much of an instructional difference things make. It's a scale of zero to one. And ideally, we want to see an effect size of 0 0.40. When we hit things with an effect size of 0 0.40, that's when we really start to talk about the zone of desired effects, things making um, a, a difference in terms of student achievement and um, data and such. So we start to see that the effect sizes goes up um, when parents have contacts with caregivers. There are information sessions that go beyond just the here's some books, but here are um, information sessions of an increasing duration and demonstrations of reading. So when a caregiver, when a parent or a caregiver has somebody saying, here's how we could, we could do it. Watch me as I walk, read to this third this three-year-old and watch how I draw the child's attention to the words or what have you, that the effect sizes really increase. Um, and Newman in that 2021 article explains this pretty candidly. If we are likely to make a difference, programs need to engage families, build trust and psychological support that enhance those book reading opportunities. 